Now, in the final portion of the programme, we're going to switch gears a little and talk about how technology is radically changing how we both live and invest, from peer-to-peer -peer lending to robo-advisors that we've already mentioned, and the rise of algorithmic strategies. The industry is seeing a profound impact in how it does business. And for more on that, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Bloomberg's Fabio Benedetti-Valentini. Good morning. I'm Fabio Benedetti Valentini. I'm a reporter at Bloomberg News at the Paris office. I've been covering finance and financial matters for, for about 10 years. I'm, I'm very glad to be joined here by four panelists, uh, quite a diverse uh, group of panelists. Um, so to, 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 my, to my right, um, to my right uh, I have Ruth Fox Blader, who's a director of Entemis, um, a venture capitalist, uh, and then Lisa Jacobs. Um, Chief Strategies Officer at uh, Funding Circle, Sean Port, CIO um, at uh, Nutmeg, and uh, Murtaza Asad Sied from Yamoni, co founder and CIO. So we have two CIOs, uh, Chief uh, Strategy and, uh, and, and Venture Capital. It's quite a diverse, diverse group. Um, so it will be a while to open up a bit of discussion. Um, uh, to, to, and I wanted to start to have uh, maybe half a joke, but. <laughs> How do you see and where do you see fintech making a difference? Should it be more because fintech services are, are intelligent, are easy, are low cost for the clients? Where do you see it coming from? Where do you see your services or your investments making a difference? Shall I, I don't start? know who wants to start. I'll, I'll, I'll start, maybe. Uh, yeah, so for us, all, all three of those. Um, for, for Nutmeg, when we launched in 2012, we believe we were solving a fundamental problem, and that's about accessibility. So if you look at a typical wealth manager in the UK, you need £800,000 to become a client and have a discretionary portfolio service. That's a really valuable service, and there's no reason that shouldn't be accessible to a really wide range of the population. So we start at £500. So accessibility is one of the key things. And again, cost isn't just about low cost. It's also about transparency of cost, and that really predates the MIFID changes. So we've been displaying our costs and charges in pounds and pence on an ongoing daily basis since 20, 2012 when we launched. So it's all of those. Um, ease of use is also super important. I think when you look across what the impact that fintechs had across Europe, across the world, it is about this access. It's about what I think fintechs have done very well, is finding portions of consumers, of, of people who are relatively underserved and really focusing on them and providing a great service for them, which data and technology have enabled us to do. So it wasn't the same 10, 20 years ago. Um, what Funding Circle do, we're a platform for small business loans. Um, so we're at, on both sides of the platform for small businesses, we're providing finance that they previously have found difficult to get and it's been quite an arduous process. Um, in an in industry that's been uh, dominated by banks. And on the investor side, we're allowing investors access to this new asset class. Similarly to Nutmeg, at, you know, very low prices, very low prices at very um, ease, easy access uh, to get this very diversified portfolio across retail investors and institutional investors who wouldn't have had the infrastructural capability to do that previously. And we, we, are you Mortaza? Yeah, we, we are very close to, to the Nutmeg model. We, we are the, the French uh, robo-advisor uh, for, for retail. Um, I would add that um, we are looking for performance for the client. Uh, of course, transparency is a good, I think, uh, a good motto, and it's part of the value proposition. For But in the end of the day, the retail client and even institutional, they're investing to make money. They're investing to perform. And the key value proposition for us is simplicity, because you, you, you give a mandate to someone who will do it for you, so there is a service, and it has not to be too complex because you're handing over, uh, and you have to understand what's going on, but in the end of the day, the value proposition is really efficiency in performance. Is why the index funds, why the ETF are making better, and you know, we talk about the US, uh, that the trend is sort of, the, the debate is over, over there, and it's still, Pending in, the, in Europe because it's very fragmented and slower, it, it prevailed because it just performed better. So uh, I think on the on the retail side, we, we have to we have to acknowledge that that's the main value proposition for long term for the client is to say that we are going to perform better than the active management who are charging too much fees to perform, uh, and that's very we, we're very you know very simple about the value proposition is simple and efficient. 
transparency is now is a prerequisite, so it, it's not going to differentiate mm -hmm. us for, from the rest, thanks to regulation. But mm -hmm. So I think transparency, is, I think, was a, a good start 2012 to 2017, but I think now we, we really have to get into the beef and its, it's uh, efficiency and performance. Mm -hmm. And for you, Ruth, what's the best investment in fintech? Should it be an easy service, a clever one? I would have been shocked if any of the startups joining me on this stage hadn't said everything. <laughs> all of the above, absolutely all of the above is, is a prerequisite um, for raising venture capital, certainly. Um, I think what's interesting is that, so obviously I'm a venture capital investor. I invest in startups and emerging technology, but most of our investors at Anthemis or, and our LPs are financial institutions, and they invest in us because they're scratching their heads about these topics too. They're saying, okay, wait a minute, so it's gonna be fast, cheap, and good. It's gonna be intelligent, it's gonna be you know, uh, user friendly, it's going to be uh, inexpensive. You know, how are these guys doing this? So that's one of the things that we do is provide some transparency and access to, you know, the likes of these guys on the stage who have, who build with the attitude within the DNA of the company. It's going to be all of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, coming, coming to the markets where you operate, I, I mean, I, I know at Antimis you also invest in other parts of the world, not only Europe, you're a global investor, mm -hmm. and Farnham Circle, uh, you're, um, you're also in, in, in the US, if I'm not mistaken. But, but talking about Europe, because we are here, I mean, it's a series of conferences, you know, taking place, you know, after Amsterdam, Frankfurt, now we are in Paris, and, you know, Europe has these, you know, very deep traditional savings channels. And so where do you see your, your fintech solutions or, or the investments, your, your you, you, you're making it, and Tim is, in your case, Ruth, where, where do you see you know, them making a difference, and where do you see the, the disruption really happening in Europe going forward? So I think that Europe is, is really interesting. It's, it's not a single market, mm -hmm. I think, for financial services in terms of um, you know, the sort of cultural attitudes towards financial services, mm -hmm. incumbent players, um, existing channels, wealth distribution. So I think one of the things that we're seeing as we get you know, later into the journey of FinTech, which really, I think, mm -hmm. took hold in the wake of the financial crisis, mm -hmm. um, is this pan-European -Europe pan question beginning to be posed. And so there are um, companies which have been extremely successful in their home markets, and some of the folks on the stage represent um, those startups which have made the jump into incredibly different markets and sort of said, okay, we're going to deal with these challenges. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the European context um, is, uh, is, is friendly to some extent uh, in terms of you know, certain uh, regulatory um, similarities or you know, previously the ability to passport. Mm -hmm. London was, you know, not previously, it still is the ability to passport, and London has been an extremely important market. So many folks have said, okay, we'll set up shop here, we'll take the plunge into Europe. Um, and I think that what many companies uh, encounter uh, are such incredibly different attitudes of customers. And, you know, much like any large financial institution, mm -hmm. but when you're a smaller team, you're a smaller shop, it's, it's quite difficult to deal with. We're definitely seeing um, this trend as the next frontier for many of our portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. I guess what we've seen is on the investment landscape in particular, um, when we started, I mean, we operate in the UK, the US, Germany, and the Netherlands, and when we started, then the types of investors who we attracted were relatively unsophisticated, risk-taking uh, investors. There's actually been a transition, I think, as these fintech platforms, as these investment platforms have become much more mainstream. They've shown track record, and actually investors, um, very sophisticated investors, institutional investors, have got very comfortable with the track record that these platforms have, have shown. So we started with um, retail investors. We've subsequently um, diversified such that we now have a large number of institutional lenders lending directly, um, Aegon lend through the platform, so we're attracting um, insurance companies. We also have a listed fund. A couple of investors have securitized loans from the platform. And so we're actually seeing this, this huge amount of sophistication in the investors and this broadening of the base of investors who are attracted to these platforms as a result of the successes and, and, and these platforms moving into the mainstream. 
so for us, you know, clearly Europe and the UK has, has, a, has a big savings problem. Yeah, it's not just that we're not saving enough, it's also that we're not investing as, as well. And with the UK, there's a, a huge amount of freedoms in how we manage our pensions. Uh, so people need to be investors, uh, and people that haven't got any investing experience now are looking after their own pensions. So you know, it's really important financial education helps people along this, this journey. Mm. You know, Nutmeg, we're not targeting millennials. We've never targeted millennials, so the average age is about 40. But the average age of a first-time investor at Nutmeg is 35. So people are coming to investing quite late in their sort of life cycle. Um, so really, we need to do a good job in helping people through that investing journey because it's such an important part of their future future life. Um, so for us, that's a key part of, of our mission. But it's an enormous market because so many people are just stuck in cash, uh, not doing anything. They're earning you know, negative real rates for lifetime savings. Saving is cash is obviously very damaging. Uh, and even if investment returns are the 3 to 5% that Vanguard are talking about, net of fees, they still need to be earning quite a good return to, to fund their future retirement. So for us, you know, getting people to invest, getting people to invest early as possible to be focused on goals is very much an important part of what we do. And what is the biggest hurdle there to, to, to get them? Apathy, I would say. Yeah, apathy is the biggest problem, even for banks that have those customers already, getting them out of cash into an investment service. For us, ease of use is what helps people get over that service, that problem. Often people think, was that it? That was so easy, I should have done this before. Uh, and a lot of people come with this mental block, this is going to be hard and it takes some time, but you know, five, ten minutes through the process, and they become investors and we help them through that journey on an ongoing basis. So it's that kind of mental block of investing is hard and complex, largely because the industry promotes that hard and complex attitude because it, that's when they can charge high fees for it. So if I get back to my third question, you know, it should be easy, the investment <laughs> that you offer. It, it should be easy. I think coming back to some, some of the points that Manga make is investing should be simple, it should be low cost, it should be easy for everyone. So we put a lot of focus on making this proposition really broad so everyone can have access to a, a portfolio management service, whether you're a high net worth with several million pounds or whether you're a first time investor with your first 500 pounds. Mm -hmm. and, and for you, Murtaza, what, what yeah, is the I'm, way to... You know, I, I like Sean is complaining about the, the UK and the fact that people have maybe low literacy or experience with financial uh, savings, but just imagine for the French market, um, I didn't want to mention the livret A. <laughs> you know, the livret A, the four en euro, like uh, all those products that are very like banking culture in terms of like no risk, uh, liquidity, money market and, and, and fixed income. You have to remember that, especially continental Europe, as opposed to Anglo-Saxon world, is, is much more on the, on the safe side and the fixed income in the, uh, culture and intimidated by the life insurance and the banks. It's not at all a capital market uh, culture. So. Um, as you said, the distribution channel that are in place are not favoring the fact that you know you should buy or diversify in stock or or even on an ETF, which is an opportunity for us. But of course, if if they didn't do it for the last 30 years, can imagine that when you come up uh, and you have a it, it's a new story. It's very it takes time to 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 get into into the market. So for us, I think we we know the the end game. Uh, is, is to have a lot of people, a lot of European savers. As you mentioned, it's a, it's a segmented market, but in the end, you know, the indu auto industry, like 100 years ago in Europe, was very fragmented. In the end, there's like very few, and everybody, a very few um, company now, and everybody's got a car. So it's going to happen. We know that everybody's going to have ETF and diversified portfolio, um, at least in Europe. It's just how long it's going to take, and, and who will be, you know, you know strong enough to, to, to go up to t this time. Um, so my, my take is that when you have a bull market, you have slow moves and everybody, everybody, everything is easy and it's, you know, there is a lot of company out there uh, and you don't see the changes. The ma major change will come with the, with the bear market and we all know this, bear market really change things and it makes appear the, the slow trend that was behind. So uh, I think in two, in two to five years, there would be obviously uh, one bear market and, and it's going to shake the industry, especially mm -hmm. the savings, the retail, they will be afraid, but then the ETF, I think, will prevail in terms of performance and, and the next wave will see 80% of market share for ETF on mm -hmm. the retail side. It's just that, you know, who of us is going to survive in the room, mm -hmm. um, you know, won't, won't be the one who performed the best, but will be the one that would be robust enough to, to go through this, uh, these tough times. Uh, but I think it's just a matter of time. <laughs> That's my, my point is, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. 
Right, you mentioned, you know, w w what if we were, we were in a bear market? I mean, things have been quite volatile these last few days, but in, 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 in uh, you know, in, in, in the way you use the ETFs, you know, and, and given the current market situation, you know, where do you see, you know, the, the, your ETF offering, you know, yeah, from now, between now and five years from now, you know, how much is it going to, what actually, what are you going to do from your perspectives, you know, for the development of ETFs? I, I think this is, a, this is a great question in the sense that we are talking about, a st we're often being asked on a, on a static basis, you know, what are UTF fixed income? And I think the ETF, over the last three years we've been operating, we've seen a massive change in the offering. So the new, uh, uh, new providers, but just simply new markets. And in two, three years, I would, I would love to see, you know, crowdfunding ETF. I would love to see, um, you know, private equity ETF, even if it's sort of weird stuff into like mm. private equity ETF. With, so not supposed to marry together. But, uh, mm. but in terms of, if you think about David Swenson and the Yale model, you find out that diversification doesn't stop just by looking at financial market. It stops, never stops. You increase into your assets. So that would be, I think, a, a, big, a big challenge for us is to include more into our portfolio uh, because ETF industry is growing wider. Mm -hmm. I see. So it depends on you know, the providers. It's a call for providers here. Mm -hmm. If you have new ETFs, mm -hmm. I would be interested. And for you, Sean? I'm not so sure we need many more ETFs, actually. I think we, need, we maybe need better ETFs uh, and maybe cheaper ETFs. Um, so, sorry about that. Uh, but I think you know, you've got to bear in mind that ETFs in Europe are not retail products, really. They're institutional products. Most of the money, most of the flow is institutional, and they're not really in the hands of many retail investors. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the hands of some hobbyist investors that are starting to get excited about ETFs, but largely the, the press, the wealth management industry as a whole, is quite negative on ETFs. So they're not really being promoted to the retail mm -hmm. public. And certainly looking at financial advisors in the UK, they have no real platform to be able to trade ETFs effectively, to, to be able to get the best out of these, these tools. So the infrastructure isn't necessarily there for the end investor to get excited about ETFs. So we've got a long way to get people into ETFs. Uh, they're still regarded as a bit untested in, mm -hmm. in the retail population, a bit sort of dangerous. Uh, on the older population, whereas the younger population get it. Um, so there's a lot of work to do on, on ETFs within the end investor, and there's not really many voices out there that are promoting ETFs as a force for good to the end investor. It's largely about negative uh, stories about ETFs. Mm -hmm. People like us, um, you guys, are also talking about ETFs to the end investor. We do a lot of work on trying to educate people, communicate the benefits, mm -hmm. but it's still an uphill battle against uh, mm -hmm. mainstream press. But despite this negative assumption in, in, in the retail market you are, you're mentioning, you know, how many of your, of your clients, in, in how many of their, their, fund, I mean their, their portfolios do you, do you have ETFs? Is it a majority already? 100%. 100%, yeah, 100%. Yeah, so we started 100% back in 2012. We built a whole ecosystem around getting the best out of the ETFs. Mm. That's 99% you know, OTC trading, having a fractional share ownership. I'm not sure if any other firms have that in Europe. Yes, that means well, I can own one pence of any ETF I like, which mm. means that someone that gives me 50 pounds or 100 pound monthly mm. contribution, I give them 12,000 underlying securities uh, yeah, with no kind of cash drag. So we've built our whole ecosystem around getting the best from ETFs because they're fantastic tools. Mm. But ultimately, the end investor doesn't really care that much. Mm -hmm. uh, most investors don't really care that they own ETFs. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. And, and making maybe a transition with Funded Circle, do, do, you, do you have guys a, a, an ECM, uh, SME, sorry, ETF, you know, in your offering and uh, how, you know. We have small caps. Yes, you have small caps, yeah, you do. And, you and do. I would yeah. say that we, we don't do fractional shares, but uh -huh. uh, we do a lot of index funds, which is the easiest way of, of doing fractional mm -hmm. shares. But, okay. but clearly the, the point about Europe is, again, the same about cars. You kind of have, have cars if you don't have roads. And the infrastructure in Europe is really poor to trade mm -hmm. ETFs, especially because it's fragmented and there is the Euronex on the one side, there is the German market on the other side. Listed ETFs are not trading the same. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very, very big issue when you're retail, doing retail, those are the issues you, 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 you face. And, and I would not argue for five basis points on the, on the total expense ratio on ETF. I'm going to lose 40 basis points when I'm going to trade on the market. So it's going, the, 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 basic, the basic trading issue is, is sort of killing the ETF for retail. Mm. Uh, this is going to improve, but again, it's a question of time, and the quickest, the better. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. I and guess the, the proposition that we have at Funding Circle, it's not an ETF, 
It shares some of the similar characteristics, highly diversified portfolio, very accessible. Um, but actually, the businesses, uh, the, the end asset, a small business credit, which is an average of about £75,000 on, on the ticket size, so very much at the smaller end of S SME credit. But we have seen um, in kind of the slightly larger end, kind of the, the mid caps, actually a huge amount of funds coming into the space. Um, and there is clearly demand from the investment community to have access to smaller businesses uh, in this very diversified way. There's not many platforms that are doing uh, similar thing as us in terms of the, the size of ticket, but to be able to provide that level of diversification for such an attractive asset is something that we don't see elsewhere. Yeah, the market fundamentals definitely are, are causing people to seek this kind of innovation. I think it's really, what's really interesting, I mean, this is the first conference I've been to in the past two years where I think the word crypto has yet to be spoken <laughs> and breaking the seal. But um, we, you know, our job is really to look very much in the future. When I was told that I was going to go to a conference, you know, the subject of which was ETFs, I was like, oh. An innovation conference, like that was innovative when I was six. Um, but this is, you know, so I think that we have this perspective of um, ETFs as a building block or a tool for some of these propositions where the innovation is, is, is about sort of democratization or access um, and sort of shifting attitudes, um, creating new kinds of securities that are interesting institutional investors, which I think is incredibly surprising, but incredibly interesting. And then, you know, as what we're looking at as, as fintech investors is really around sort of new securities. What are the next frontiers? Um, how are we sort of presenting diversification in terms of uh, risk um, also on the insurance side? Um, there's real, what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of these very traditional players have appetite for, you know, sophisticated, uh, diversified products, and it's our job to sort of hunt down what's next. I see. And so where is the, where would you put your, your money? What, what is the big bet you would make in, is it more, <laughs> no, it's a hard question. <laughs> there's, no, there's, a, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh. stuff happening. And I think that to your point, there's also a sort of testing of market cycles, which is going to happen. Yeah. The yeah. prediction has already, you know, the gauntlet's been laid down the next, how many years did you say before we, we have our, our big down cycle? Yeah. Two to five years. You know, two to five years, yeah. Two to five years. But now, but we are just about... This is about the game of prediction. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe two to five years, we'll have an ETF on crypto. All the risk models nice. are, are, are wrong. So, yeah, uh, two to five years, we have the ETF of crypto. Let's see. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Well, without mentioning crypto too, too much, but, you know, we, we have all this n new set of products, flourishing, you know, initiatives in, in, on the fintech field, you know. I mean, about 10 years after Lehman, you know, there have been up and down since then, but we are in sort of a volatile environment. The markets have many reasons to be upset these days, really. And, you know, what if we were again in a Lehman moment, you know, uh, what, you know, do you see fintech solutions or the fintech investments you have been doing, you know, more as a power breaker, you know, if there is a, a, a big crisis or, or more as a, a channel propagating Panic, you know, is it is it more of a solution to the next crisis or or more of a risk? I mean, I guess it's both, but I think that what we're seeing, the trend in the market that we're seeing, is that fintech, which was proposed initially as being uh, very much in contradiction to and contesting the power of financial institutions. Mm -hmm. um, are, is now much more frequently collaborating with, with financial institutions, which is something at Anthemis that we've always predicted and believed in. So I think that, um, you know, what we're going to see, let's see, who knows. Um, but I think that financial technology innovation is here to stay. Um, you know, the, and we haven't even, we've been talking a little bit more about the distribution side and customer acquisition, but there's the data side. I mean, there's a hu huge amount of competition. Um, you know, for, for people who would have gone into asset management previously, who would have gone to work for banks who are now working in tech, um, or who would have been actuaries who are now working in tech. So I think that the cross-pollination actually yields a ton of opportunities. That's what we're excited about. I think if you think about the last crisis, you know, part of the challenge 
um, was the level of concentration, the level of kind of the same businesses doing the same things. So I think to Ruth's point, the competition, the innovation actually strengthens that and adds a bit more stability to the system because you don't have everyone operating in, in, in the same way. Um, there will be winners and losers. I think there will be winners and losers across all, all different types of businesses, fintechs, traditional institutions. Um, and the, but I do think that the fintechs that come out strong, which will be those who've you know, invested in the robustness of their business and will be the, the strongest, they will set this new wave where actually there will be a huge amount more adoption of fintechs, a huge amount more acceptance. Because I think the challenge that we all face um, whenever, whenever we're asked about the future is, you've not been through a cycle yet, what does that look like, will you, will you fall away? And I think as a, you know, we have people who've been through a cycle at Funding Circle, we do stress tests on the book, we look at how the asset will, will perform, and we feel very comfortable around it. But until we've actually lived through that, there are definitely always going to be uh, doubters and, and questions around it. So I think this is a challenge of communication for us uh, in the main. So if you look back to April 15 to February 16, the UK market fell by 24%. So a lot of investors, that felt like Armageddon. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a question of how you communicate, how you engage with customers. And we mm -hmm. came through that really well. And also Brexit. The Brexit vote for us could have been you know, absolutely hor horrendous. And actually, we were very aggressive in over-communicating with our clients, really engaged with them very actively. We positioned for all the tail risks we thought were there. Uh, that actually worked really well for us. Uh, we had positive returns over the first two days. And we actually got more clients through that Brexit experience than, than losing clients. We actually got more money from our current clients. Um, so actually, it was a very tough environment, but actually we came out really well. And I think we did a better job than the established wealth management community did around Brexit, because they were dismissing it as a risk. Um, in the same way, we get, when we get the next correction, the challenge is going to be communication. And actually, I think our model has more advantages than disadvantages compared to a face-to-face -face model. Clearly, you need your relationship managers talking to your clients. That's very difficult to do when you have several hundred clients per uh, advisor. We have data that tells us what customers are going to do. We track behavior really accurately, and we can predict what people are going to do using data. So, and then we communicate in certain ways and measure it in, in, in different ways. So we have data that gives us insights which aren't there when you have a face-to-face -face model. I, I, I see two things. One that relates with what Sean mentioned. Uh, he mentioned communication. I, I will mention more leadership in the sense of ours. We, we're small companies, uh, and, uh, and the assets we have is, is really the people. So well, we don't have cost advantages compared to the big ones, and that's the, the second trend. But, uh, so we, we always have to be the leader in terms of taking opportunities, maybe taking risk in a sense, but really being out there and, and and, and be the first talking to the client and be always take, taking the, the risk of, of being sort of in person, uh, putting your face in front of the media or putting your face. Because my competitor, like, I, would, you know, I could mention French, name, French banks, they, there is no one coming up and saying, you know, I manage your portfolio. I, I see Sean is doing a lot of videos saying, you know, I manage your portfolio in a sense. And I, here is what's going on. And we, we do the same. And this is, I would say, it's something that is very, 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 um, very strong asset of fintech is really to be the people in, in charge. The second is I think about the ETF is we, we should we should be worried or at least aware that the ETF revolution is about concentration. It's not about anything else. Is there's the concentration on asset management is going to be huge. Uh, never active management, regardless of the assets. Uh, asset class was as, as concentrated as it is now in ETF. Even in the, in the days of PIMCO, when PIMCO was the largest fixed income manager, it never had this amount of concentration. And, and fixed income is a very large sort of scale play. But now we have like three to five uh, asset manager in the world that is going to concentrate like most of the assets. And of course, this is, there is a cost advantage. But this is the story. It's the story of concentration. So FinTech, at one point, will will be in this trend of concentration, and and clearly there is too many fintechs. If you look at you know if there's three ETF providers in the world, you know how come there could be like fifty thousand fintech uh, distributing ETF? So I think there is something that we will see happening. Mm -hmm. But I think the story about co corporate, especially in the financial services, is concentration. That's what happened after the crisis. We talk about banks and they failed. They didn't fail. Like there is four banks now that are bigger than ever. In the US, it's a whole market of concentration. The banks just got bigger. So you know, we, we talk about bear market uh, impact. Is Concentration is the trend that is underlying the whole ETF industry, I think. 
Well, thank you for taking the last word from the concentration, communication, and I think more acceptance, Lisa, you say it at some point in terms of finding a solution to the next, and, and to the next uh, downturn. And cross-pollination, I think it's a word that I particularly liked and the way things may go forward. But I really wanted to thank our four panelists for being with us today. Thank you so much, Fabio and panelists. What a great way to end the conference. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely feeling fired up about ETFs after today, have learned a lot, and really looking forward to the conversations that we might have in the next six months or a year from now, and to see whether any of the questions that have been put forward today will have answers or have evolved by then. So that concludes our program, and I hope you all learned something as well. And whether you're an active manager looking to beat the benchmark or currently working in the ETF space, that you're already finding yourself thinking differently about the market and strategies in Europe. Uh, we encourage you to take the remaining time to network with your peers. There will be juice and coffee uh, still served outside where you were before the conference. I want to thank also, of course, our host and sponsor, Vanguard, again, uh, for helping us uh, put this together and for giving us the opportunity to do this event. And as for reaching out to those retail investors, maybe one way to start could be to continue the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag future of ETFs and hashtag Vanguard Europe, along with the handle at Bloomberg Live. And just a final note, uh, I wasn't going to mention cryptocurrencies, but Ruth, you brought them up. So just wanted to say that Bloomberg Live is having a cryptocurrency event in London that I'll be moderating this Friday as well, if any of you are around and want to come. So thank you so much and see you all shortly.